show you is the finished product, and then we'll go back in time and remake it. So it will be very unimpressive. It looks pretty much exactly the same. The only real thing that is different is you'll see I've added an animation. But because I want to focus on programming, uh, I added the animation programmatically. So I'm not going to use Unity animation curves at all. And you see one game logic issue. I didn't update the count. So it thinks I have 12, like the original version. Um, so we'll uh, fix that too. What I'm going to do is just create a brand new project. We'll call it better rollerball. Better rollerball. All right. I made that skateboard. Which is not what we're going to use in here. <laughs> I'm going to go to the asset store and you go window, asset store. This is not what I wanted you to do, so I wanted you to learn how to do all this stuff. But I'm going to start here so that totally fine. Uh, don't import into a project that you're working on. You could cause some problems. Uh, you need to know a little bit more about what you're importing because it might overwrite things. But this is brand new, and it's totally safe to import into a brand new project. You can see my project fo uh, folder. It was empty a second ago. Now, here is our scene right here. This is probably what yours should look like. You can totally use your version of Rollerball, but if you want to just make sure that everything is exactly the same, you can totally load this version up. Uh, make sure that actually plays. All right, looks like it's working. So one of you mentioned that the ball destroyed itself when it hit a pickup. So let's recreate that. Uh, there's a nice organization that should hopefully uh, look somewhat like yours. Oh, skateboard is beautiful. So we're going to go... This. Is that better for you guys? All right. So we're going to go... I think the player controller is the script that actually destroys the ball, which I personally think is a really bad logical decision. Uh, we are going to be modifying this. Well, what I'm going to do is copy it and modify a copy instead of modifying the original. Uh, here is where on trigger enter happens. And if it had a pickup tag, the other object uh, was, now it wasn't destroyed, it was turned off. Uh, it's set inactive. Uh, so you saw that it worked a minute ago. Uh, normally we would use this dot uh, game object to refer to the game object this script is attached to, but you don't actually have to write this dot game object. The only reason I'm doing this right now is so you can see how similar these are. This would destroy the ball and the pickup. So with one line, the first line, this dot game object set active false, that'll destroy the object the script is attached to. The second line says other uh, set active false, that'll destroy the other or set inactive the object we collided with. So this should knock out both the ball and the object we collide with. Make sure you hit save. If you don't hit save and you go back, you won't see any of your changes when you hit play. So that's super important. So there we go, boom. Lost both of them. So that was probably your, your issue, is that you took out the wrong one. Uh, so we don't want that line of code. And control slash is the uh, way to comment these. Well, I think I might have modified my 
hotkey. Control slash should be the key that comments things out. All right. So I don't like the fact that the ball is the thing destroying the other objects. So what I'm going to do instead, I want to move basically this collision code into a script attached to each individual object. So we're going to modify our pickups. There's a whole bunch of them. So what I'm going to do is delete all of them except one. And I'm kind of lazy. So I want this pickup to be right in front of the ball so I can hit it without working hard. So I think probably four. Nope. That's my rotation messing everything up. There we go. And I think my scene view would be helpful to be aligned with the actual view in the game. Alright, so I just have one. I'm just making it really simple now. Oh, this is perfectly demonstrating what I just mentioned. So I modified my code, but didn't hit save. And I can tell there's a little tiny asterisk right here. So I'm going to hit save now. I didn't modify anything. All I did was save the changes I had made a minute ago. And now hit play, and it should only destroy or set an act with the proper object. All right. So first thing I'm going to do, there's a rigid body right here attached. Uh, we don't actually use, rigid bodies are if you want to apply actual physics, uh, you would need a rigid body component. The other thing the rigid body does, if you have two colliders, one on each object, if there's no rigid body on either object, they actually can't collide. So you need at least one of them to have a rigid body. You don't want to have rigid bodies on things that you're not going to actually use physics on. If we look at this rotator script attached to the uh, pickup, we entirely determine how this thing moves right here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is delete this object, or delete this component, remove component. It should function the exact same way. So my motivation for doing so is that every rigid body, there's actually computation that occurs. And it's a physics computation. It basically, it's extra calculations that have to be made. Now, if I was going to fling these uh, pickups around, like if I was going to collide and then have it go flying, like add a force to it and then let the physics kind of take over and have it move with gravity and all that, I would totally need a rigid body. But we don't do any actual physics with them, we just do a simple rotation. So I don't need a rigid body to do that. Uh, you may not be paying attention, but it, it rotates just like it did before. Like there's no double click, you can zoom in. There's no change in the way it behaves, even though I took that rigid body off. All right, so first thing we're going to do is uh, make a better pickup. Now, there's this little, up here in the inspector, there's this little thing that says prefab. You can hit uh, select, and it will, in the project, select the pickup down here. Now, if I want a whole bunch more, I could drag them out to here, but you really want to put them in the pickups uh, object. We're using pickups object like a container, almost like a folder. Like if you look, every object in Unity has a transform, and that's the only necessary component on every single object. If you have an empty object, it at least has a transform. And this is nice. This transform's nice because it lets you move everything inside. If you watch, they all move together, basically. So it lets you do nice things like that. You can also do a rotation if you wanted to kind of offset it like that. And then you hit play, and then each one will still, in its own local space, rotate like it did before. Back. All right, so I want to make a better pickup than these right here. So this is a good starting point. It's not further. Away. It's not a bad place to start, but one thing you should uh, never do on your base object. So here's my pickup object itself. You should never actually attach the cube. Basically, all this mesh stuff should not be attached here. And I like to. 
I like to put my uh, visual components on a sub object. And if you look, I deleted the rigid body, but not on this object. It was the one I deleted. So pull that rigid body off. I don't want this shader here because I want it to look differently. Oh, there's my material. All right, so I'm going to go. You do Control D to duplicate, and I'll just be on creative and call it pickup one material. I'm just going to change the look to purple so it looks like that version we saw. A little. I don't like things to be that intense. Turn it down a little bit. Yeah, I find the upper right corner to be kind of offensive to my eyes, like somewhere, somewhere a little bit away from that. And all we have to do is take this. You can drop it in the on the object there, or you can drop it right here. It doesn't matter which of the two ways you do it, and it should. <coughs> all right, apparently it didn't work. So I'll just drop it in the actual slot that it should be dropped into. There, it's pick up one. Now it's purple. All right, but I don't want all the visual stuff in the same object. I want to create a base object that uh, will have all basically the code to rotate it, and then I want my visual stuff in a sub object. So I'm going to go down here and create empty. So I'll call this better pickup. And I'm just going to take pickup and drag it inside, right there. So if you look at this transformation 000, it's the identity transformation. Uh, let's see. Now, if I reset position to 00, zero right there, so let me hit play. This rotator script, what I'm going to do is duplicate this. Now, just like in Java, your uh, file name has to be your class name. So if I call it rotator1, you can see a little preview of the actual code right here. It's a really bad place to really read code. But you can at least see it's public class rotator right there. So I'm going to call it uh, pickup because my script's going to do more than just rotate. It's going to rotate and destroy the pickup and get hit by the ball. So we'll open it up here. So it's exact copy of rotator. Now, first thing I need to do, uh, and <clears throat> by default, you really, uh, the console's not open, but it's really important to have. I'm going to actually console. I like to dock it. Doesn't really matter. You generally don't need a huge game window when you're developing stuff. But we'll just kind of crowd out the game window right there. So this is the global namespace already contains a definition for rotator. No problem. This thing should be called pickup. All right, so that should end in hit save. That should take care of this. Let's take a second or two for it to actually uh, recompile everything. Let us do it. All right, so I'm just going to leave just a single rotate in here. Uh, but what I want to do is attach this at the base level here. So now this is going to rotate. So what I don't need is a second rotation. So I'm going to remove this rotator right here. When it comes to the collider, you, you should also have your collider not on your base object. Your collider, basically your script should be on your base object. Pretty much that's it. And then uh, you could you would put your rigid body down here as well. But usually you want all your visual things in uh, a sub object. So I'll just call this model. That would be like the physical representation of this object. Uh, and everything else should be okay. So I think we'll see the first weird thing happen right now. I'm going to hit play. It'll rotate. It'll rotate in a weird way. Let's see what in the world's going on. I'm going to click. I'm clicked on model now. I'm going to click on better pickup. That didn't help much. So I think these little arrows go to kind of the center of mass of the object you clicked on, not necessarily the object's actual mass. 
So the thing that's going wrong here is there's an offset of 6.87. So when it rotates, it's rotating around a point that is 6.87 meters away from the actual model, which is why you saw it rotate around a circle. So when I push this to zero, unfortunately that moves the model to the origin. However, what should be moved is the base object over here. Let me move it up a tiny bit. Now it should rotate in a, in a normal way. And so it's really important that this transform was zero 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 right here. So if I if I increase this, uh, we'll get that similar phenomenon we saw before. And that would happen if I change any of these right here. It's going to rotate around a point that's not the center of the model. And the good news is when you make changes in play mode and you unplay or stop playing, it unchanges everything, goes back. The bad news is if you made some cool change, you will lose it. Um, there is a way to apply it. I don't know off the top of my head, but you can look it up and figure that out. So we really haven't done anything yet. What we're going to do next is put the collision uh, information or the collision logic into this pickup script right here. So I'm double clicking this pickup. That's a one fast way to open it back up here. So over in the player controller, I don't want to set it false over here. And I have a, my main motivation for doing this is because I want to create an animation on this object that's going to take more than zero seconds to complete, and then I want the object to be inactive when it's done animating. So I want to start the animation basically here, and then when the animation is done, I want the object to be disabled. So that's the main. That's my motivation for moving the logic into a different script. Otherwise, the ball would have to. Be in charge of rotating, uh, of, of scaling this object before it's set to be inactive. And I might hit seven of them really quickly, and now I have to like keep track of seven of them inside this script. So that, that's the main reason that I think this should be done in the uh, script attached to the object you're hitting. I'm completely okay with this count right here because there's only one kind of counter, there's not a counter inside of each pickup, so I'm okay with the count happening right here. So now we get to do the fun stuff, which is start uh, accessing scripts from other scripts. I think this was done a little bit with a set count text. Nope, we didn't even do that there. All right, so we'll be doing something brand new. So I'm going to go other dot, uh, get, uh, I think we got to go transform first dot get component. So now I should explain components a little bit. My 10 second description of components. Every little box you see in the inspector is a component. The only component you're required to have is a transform. Uh, our better pickup has one more component, which is a pickup. So it's literally called pickup. So if I want to access this, I access it like that. I'm getting the pickup component of that object. So it's actually the script. So I'll be able to access the script here. And I better declare an object, a reference to this. So I will, this is going to be pickup. I recommend you be very uncreative with your uh, names, your class name. I just lowercase it for the object name, just like I do pretty much every other time that I can get away with it. All right, so we're going <clears> to. <throat> This is just a reference to the script. Now what I need to do is call a method on the script. Now if we go back to pickup, all we have is an update method. We're actually going to, we're going to leave this alone. This is the, the default is very close to protected in C Sharp, uh, but I'm going to make it officially private. So we couldn't access update from outside of here anyways. Most uh, people will come in here and write the method before they go and call it somewhere else. What I'm going to do is call a method that doesn't exist, and it will actually speed things, speed the actual coding process up. So I'm just going to call the method hit. Now it's complaining, it's underlined in red because hit doesn't exist. We just saw the pickup code, it's not in there. And what I'm going to do is generate the method hit. So 
So it's going to create a hit automatically. This should be public. Public void hit. All right, now in here is where I want to destroy that object. So it's easy to do. Copy this. Actually, I'll cut it because I don't want to destroy it here anymore. And I will paste it in here. Now it's not other anymore. It's just this dot game object dot set active. Now you're going to see most people don't bother writing this dot inside your own in inside. Uh, you don't have to write this dot. All right, so this should have the exact same functionality that we had before. It's not up too high. Oh, no. All right, so let's take care of this issue. I like the console to be a little that wide. There we go. When you have a layout you like, up here you just hit uh, Save Layout, and that works. It's not really standard default. This one's got the game and the scene together. You generally don't need the game and the scene simultaneously. Uh, I like this uh, shared scene and game in the same because when I hit play, it will go from scene into game. Sometimes you need to see both, sometimes you don't. I'm going to hit this object, and right here it says object reference not set to an instance of an object on trigger enter. So if you double click it, it will take you to the line that caused it. All right, so this object pickup doesn't exist. Maybe this will fix it. Oh, it's still hmm. All right, so here's another. <clears throat> Anytime that you actually use strings, you're probably doing things a slow way. So I'm going to change my if statement. So I'm going to declare this guy out here. And instead of comparing tags, I'm going to go if pickup not null. So I try to grab the pickup script. If the pickup script is not doesn't exist, this pickup object will get the value of null. So if I try to get a component that's not attached to that object, I'll get null and back. So if pickup is null, obviously I didn't hit what I thought I hit. Maybe I hit some other type of object. So I'm changing my condition to see if I hit the object with pickup on it, um, then this won't be null, and I'll go ahead and execute the rest of that code inside. Let's see if this. Fixed it. Right, so we're not getting any reaction at all. I think I need to move my collider. So here's a fast way to move it. I copied it off of here. I don't need it anymore on this side. I'm going to put the uh, collider here. Pasting is a little bit different. I'm pasting component as new. So it should come in and be the exact same uh, box collider, but as you can see, it's not. And the reason is this model has this rotation on it right here. 
Got the 45, 45, 45 on it. So I'm going to zero that back out. Now it's got a scale of one half. I'm going to scale this out to one. You can disable the model and you'll actually see the outline of the box collider instead. So that'll let me basically be sure that my model matches my collider. So now we should. Yeah. Okay. Now I can absolutely have my collider, but I'm just hitting undo a couple times. I can actually have my collider on my model, no problem. One more. There we go. So my collider's back here. What actually happens when you hit the object, it gives you the object with the collider attached to it. So that other object is actually model, not better pickup. So what I want to do, instead of actually using model, I need to kind of go up a level to hit the pickup script. And we can do that pretty easily. Because I know it's going to be up a level. I'm going to access off the tr transform, and I'm going to do transform.parent, which is the object above. That's the parent object. This is the uh, actual object I want to get the component from, right there. So that's how I go up a level. So what was happening is I was actually hitting this model, but what I wanted to do was get a script off the parent. That sh change should fix this. Perfect. All right. So we'll fix that issue. So my motivation for doing this was I want to add an animation to this. I don't. You can totally do this using the uh, animation inside Unity, but I want to do this programmatically instead. So we're going to use something called a coroutine. You can use the built-in coroutines, but there's a way faster one. Back at the asset. Or it's called more effective coroutine. We're just going to use a free version. We don't need any of the fancy stuff off the, the pro version. So there's three parts to this animation. We're going to have a part where it grows, a part where it. No, how do I do this? We're going to do a part where it shrinks, then a part where it grows, then a part where it shrinks to zero and then disables itself. There's basically three parts to this animation. A shrink, a grow, and a shrink again. And then at the end of the last shrink, we'll make it disappear. Um. High speed internet. With the more effective coroutine three. This is nice because uh, aside from it being just straight faster, uh, it also has a very short instruction. And we're only going to, I think, read part of one page of the instruction to get started on this. So the best way to think about a coroutine is a process that happens asynchronously. So you basically kick it to get started, and then it goes on its own. Uh, this is going to be way better than trying to do something every frame in the update method, because that would be dependent on the current. You'd have to know the start time, and then your current frame time, and then you can make adjustments off that. But it's going to be a huge amount of like, if time is in this interval, then do this stuff. If it's in the other interval, do the other stuff. And if it's in the third interval, do the other stuff. And then if it's past the third interval, set it to disabled. So it's, it's a really bad way to create logic. Do it inside your update method. The only things you really should be doing in the update method, if you're taking user input, that's going to change frame to frame. So you're going to need to kind of do that every single time. 
So your player controller, really like one column layout. All right. Your player controller, it has an update method, and I think it's totally valid. It's totally valid to use update or fixed update uh, for your actual player controls. When you're taking input, any input is usually should be done in the update or fixed update. So I don't think we really need anything else in here. So we'll be doing one thing. You do need a rigid body on this uh, object, and this basically requires, if you look, the first thing we do in the start method is get the rigid body. So if I am back over here, I imported that guy. Yeah, let me close our asset store. If I delete the rigid body and hit play, it's going to tell us immediately it can't find the rigid body component right there. So you get a whole crap ton of errors coming out. That's because I deleted the rigid body. So I'm going to undo so that thing, that rigid body comes back. So here's a way to enforce having a rigid body. So I'm going to require a component type of rigid body. I'm going to hit save. So I just did that uh, require type of rigid body. And now I'm going to go to remove. Oh, look at that. They don't let me add, uh, remove this object or remove this component because the script says it's required. If I really wanted to remove the rigid body, I would have to delete the script component off of here. I'd have to go in and, and basically delete this player controller. So it's a way to enforce if I, my script requires a rigid body. If I don't have a rigid body, my script's not going to work. So if you require a rigid body, you probably should require it actually in your script. Uh, if you require other things like a collider, uh, you should have that also in there as require component type of collider. So let's go ahead and create that animation. So that installed into this uh, plugins folder. I'm going to open the quick start guide. I don't care about your advertising, although you have a good product. So we're basically just going to do this uh, run code routine right here. Uh, you can read the other instructions. I encourage you to do so. But I need to read to you right now. You probably don't. So before I'm going to be moving this set active to false uh, somewhere else. So there's a couple problems with this line. One of them is they said uh, in that file that I didn't read that you have to use. Uh, Mac, the namespace, and also I need a <coughs> I need a method that will be called. So I want to give it a better name. Um, you could call it animation, uh, but that's already a built-in class, so that'd be a really horrible name to call this thing. I do want to call it animation. So what I'm going to do is lead with a underscore. That lets me kind of use a reserve word. But it's not a reserve word because I put that in front. So animation's a bad name to use unless you use something like this. Now we have a problem because this doesn't exist. So I'm going to do generate method. Now it already did the hard work of putting in the proper uh, type that it has to return. If I go back to the uh, instructions, it will tell you right here if I would have kept reading, oh, I need this to be an I enumerator float. But it was already, uh, the IDE was already smart enough to add that in for me. All right, so now I'm going to rotate. Oh, that's a good question. It's a special type of object that basically uh, tells how long to wait. So it's not much more than a float. It's basically the number of milliseconds or nanoseconds. So basically a number. So I want this thing to start to shrink. So I'm going to have a for loop. 
So we'll go int i equals zero. Uh, we start i. I want this to run for a number of frames. So let's go int. We'll do 20 frames. I'm going to start i up high, and then i greater than, we'll go all the way greater than or equal to 0, i minus minus. And I just want to shrink this. I'm going to go transform.localScale equals, so I'm going to assume that it was scaled at 1 originally, and we'll be going i over frame, like this. So at the initial, oh, and it should be a vector 3. So I'm using this as a scale for... Actually, I have a serious problem if I do this. What I'm going to do is use the identity vector 1, 1, 1. So this way, the 1, 1, 1 vector, just 1x, 1y, 1z, that's the standard scale. And this in front will give us a basically a percentage of the 1 scale. So when i equals frame count, it'll be the original size. And then when I start shrinking and I divide, like when I is half of frame count, this will turn into 0.5. Right there. I totally lied, and you'll see why I lied. Oh, there's another thing I didn't read in the code routine. You also have to return. Go return null. You, if you don't return null, you can return an amount of time that you want it to wait. You have to return something. And how do I know that? Because it's not a void. So I have to return something. That's not void. Alright, so that's what I need. Alright, it didn't animate, it just went all the way to size 0, instantly. It should have taken 20 frames to get there. So what happened? I took an integer divided by integer, the result's an integer. Either 1 or 0. So what I need to do is make one of these not an integer. Super easy to do. I don't think that'll mess anything up. We don't generally index with floats on for loops, but there shouldn't be any problem. This should scale it down to zero. I'm gonna have to look closely because it's gonna happen quick and it's gonna get small. Oh no. Local scale, not what I think it is. One one one. So here's a good time to hit the pause button. So my ball already has some momentum, so this, the pause button obviously pauses. The button next to it goes one frame at a time. So if we watch very closely, I want to watch the scale, basically. I want to see what happens to the scale. What I'm hoping is it goes from 1 to, I think, 95%, then, 85, then 90, then 85%. I think it should be ticking down like that. Get closer and closer. Boom, there we go. 95, 90, 85%, 80. So that's what I'm... That's what I expected to see. What I didn't expect to see is this little, uh, it got grayed out. It's disabled is what happened. What we have to do is stop it from being disabled. So this line of code, set it inactive. I do want to set it inactive. However, I don't want to do it. What this does, it'll start the coroutine, and then while the coroutine is running, 
it'll set it inactive. So this line really needs to be there. To be when the animation's finished. And I'm just gonna go crazy and do 50 frames so that we can see it without slowing the uh, game down. Boom, there we go. So now it shrunk to zero. So I'm going to basically repeat this three times. I want to go small, big, small. So the second one's going to make it, I want to make it go bigger. So I'm going to start I at zero. Equal to two times string count I plus plus. That should get then. I want to use the same I value the whole time. I'm going to do something a bit strange that we don't normally do. I'm not going to declare I each for loop. I'm going to declare it once. So it's the same I value going through all of them. So it's kind of passing one value. The last, val the last value got from one for loop will be uh, the next value. You don't have to set an initial value. Just looking at the logic, my I should be zero above it. So I, that would be a little redundant to have this guy right there. And whatever I value I got, it should be frame count times two, would be the initial I value. I'm kind of passing the I value along without resetting it. So I should be small. It's going to, I want to flip that around. So I will be small, go up to frame count. And then I is going to be a big number, and then come back down to zero. So this should go small, big, small. Hopefully, pretty much as our animation. Boom, boom, boom. And then it did, and then it set. I wasn't really paying attention, but it should not. It was not set inactive until it went shrunk the last time. Uh, so that is how to use coroutines, and they are 100 times better than trying to do this inside the update. You will go crazy trying to do that. Um, so here's a really fast way to animate this. Frame count 50, that's ridiculous. Let's try like 12. So there we go. That's a little more reasonable right there. Uh, now it would be really nice if I can edit the frame count right here. So that's easy to do. All we're going to do is I want to take this and move it up. Outside everything. And if I just put public, there's other modifiers you can do uh, visible in editor, but we're just going to do the easy one here. Make it public. Now when I come back, I will get a public frame count value. And put whatever you want in here. Maybe I want to go a little faster. I can change it. So now I don't have to run back to uh, the editing the actual script itself. Um, especially if you're going to work with somebody who's not adept at working with programming, you want to put more things into the editor here. For that. And that should do it just a tiny bit faster than we saw last time. There we go. All right. Now I want to replace all those pickups that I had before. So. There's only one pre pickup prefab, so I'm going to create a prefab. It's easy to do. Just drag it. You can drag it anywhere in here, but I'm going to put it in the prefab folder to keep things organized. As soon as you have more than 10 or 20 different things in your projects folder, you better put them organized or you're going to go insane. And now I can drag a bunch of these guys in. So I could do that. So if it wasn't in prefabs, you can't really drag it into its like that won't have any real effect. Uh, but I could uh, copy and paste. Or you can do control D is the fast copy paste. This pickup? Well, this one's totally, I don't really want to use this one anymore. because This one doesn't destroy itself and has no animation.
Oh, that's that's basically what I did right there. So just drag it to pickups, and you can just do that. You know, drag it in a bunch of times. So this is useful because if I want to change all, okay, I can change the frame count down here. So let's say I want to make them all four. That should be reflected in all of these right here. And now if I change one, like let's say four is too fast, so I want to go back to seven. If I hit apply, it will actually apply it to the prefab which will in turn, so now I'm going to go to better pick up seven. It also modified that one as well. So it's kind of keeping things uniform, basically. And that'll save you a lot of time. So I think we got to end here.